Recently, I was lucky enough to speak with one of the world's leading experts on mast cell activation syndrome, Dr. Lawrence Afrin. I spoke with him at length about the role of MCAS in long COVID, and there's some really fascinating insights into the condition and its treatment. It's a long one, but a good one, and stick around till the end, as I'll be talking about how to answer a bunch of the questions that this complicated subject throws up. I first mentioned Dr. Afrin's work when discussing his paper published in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases. It's a great, very readable piece, and I do recommend taking a look. That led to the film I made with Dr. Piers regarding treatment options, and I'll be coming back to that a bit later. Before I dive into the interview, uh, a quick reminder on what mast cells actually are. They're a small but extremely important part of the immune system, being involved in wound healing, immune tolerance and defence against pathogens. Notably, they play a key role in the inflammatory process. When activated, a mast cell can either selectively or rapidly release mediators or compounds that induce inflammation from storage granules into the local microenvironment. They are also highly involved in allergic reactions. A quick note here on what these mediators are. This is a very much non-exclusive list. Second on the list here, histamine, is one that's been talked about at length on the channel before. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive into the interview. I started by asking Dr. Afrin about the role of mast cells in the body. You know, mast cells are a part of us because they're important. I mean, as long as they're putting out the right mediators in the right amounts, right times, right durations, right places in the body, then everything's fine. We stay healthy. We have an enormous uh, capacity to resist and recover from um, uh, assaults and, and insults upon our bodies. But when the mast cells start misbehaving and they start putting out the wrong mediators, wrong amounts, wrong times, wrong durations, wrong places in the body, the, the cells and the tissues that are on the receiving ends of those mediators, they don't know that they're getting the wrong signals. I mean, they're just biologically programmed to react in a certain way when a certain mediator approaches. So the fundamental issue you have going on in mast cell activation disease is you have all these cells and organs and tissues and systems in the body that are chronically waxing and waning, sometimes acutely spiking, but they're chronically reacting in ways that they shouldn't be reacting and that doesn't contribute one bit to health. When you find sort of undiagnosed people who have M with latent MCAS, how do they often present? What kind of conditions can be sort of hiding or rather presenting behind the hiding MCAS, if that makes sense? The details can vary dramatically from one patient to the next. What I've learned to look for is the big picture. You're, you're looking for by and large, chronic uh, waxing and waning, multi-system inflammation, a huge variety of symptoms depending on which systems in the body uh, happen to be inflamed. So it's chronic multi-system inflammation, plus minus allergic type issues. Um, and I say plus minus because there are plenty of MCAS patients who don't have a speck of allergy to them. Thus, we very commonly see problems with uh, the, the medical word is dystrophisms. Um, uh, broadly, it's abnormalities in growth and development in potentially any tissue in the body. A great many of the mast cell mediators exert effects that would be loosely described as inflammatory. Uh, many of the mast cell mediators exert effects that would be loosely described as allergic. And it turns out there also are a lot of mast cell mediators that are intimately involved in guiding growth and development in every tissue in the body. And the particular symptoms uh, 
uh, that any given mast cell patient is going to experience the, the particular symptoms and, and findings and problems that they're going to uh, suffer are going to be entirely dependent on which mediators are coming out from the dysfunctional mast cells uh, in which amounts, which times, which durations, which places in the body. They, again, it's not a new disease. It's a newly recognized disease. But it seems like all of a sudden there comes this disease, which by its essential biologic nature, it's not going to present in just one or two ways. It's going to present in a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand different ways. Which, to some degree, suggests the answer to what I asked about next. Why is MCAS still cutting-edge biological and medical science? Why do so few doctors know about it? Uh, I mean, we, we go through ten, uh, roughly seven to ten years of medical training to become a physician. In that ten years, we get approximately one minute of training about mast cell biology and disease, and I am not exaggerating. And it kind of makes sense that you would only get that small an amount of training in, the, in mast cell biology and disease because the only diseases we've known the mast cell to be able to cause uh, up until very recently, first of all, you've got very common allergy issues. So people very quickly lose sight of the fact that all allergy which is a very prevalent problem. 10 to 20% of the entire world suffers allergy of one sort or another. And we lose sight of the fact that allergy actually is uh, one of the most common forms of dysfunctional mast cell activation. So we've known about allergy for obviously millennia. And we've known about one other mast cell disease, the very rare disease of mastocytosis, uh, uh, which is mass uh, inappropriate mast cell activation together with cancerous over proliferation of the mast cell but you know when you go through your training if you're not going to become an allergist then you don't need to pay attention to allergy and mastocytosis is so rare that the vast majority of trained doctors they're going to come out of training they'll go into practice for the next 30 40 years and they will never see a case of mastocytosis. So if the disease is that rare, why on earth would the medical training system spend any more than one minute out of 10 years in teaching you about it? And, and so in that one minute, you're taught that mast cells produce histamine. And we've known about histamine for about 70 years or so. We have a pretty good idea of what it does in the body. You're taught that mast cells produce tryptase. We've been studying tryptase for uh, about 40, 45 years now and still don't have the foggiest idea what its principal function in the human body is. We, we, we have some notion of some of its minor functions, but what its principal role, its sort of evolutionarily designed role is, we don't know. And that's it. That's all we're taught about mast cell biology. In fact, if you ask most doctors, where are the mast cells? They won't even be able to tell you. The truth of the matter is that the mast cell produces and releases more than a thousand mediators. The biologists have known this for quite some time, but the doctors don't know this because there's no reason. There has been up until very recently, no reason for them to know this. I mean, I mean you couldn't, it, 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 if you had to cram into a doctor's head every known fact of human biology and disease, they'd be in training for their entire lives. They'd never get out into practice. So you have to put constraints on the training processes and teach doctors what they mostly need to know. Well, now it turns out there's this other mast cell disorder, MCAS, and it's turning out to be insanely prevalent. And it's starting to look like it probably, 
And again, lots of hypotheticals here, incredible amounts of research that have to be done to prove or disprove what I'm contending here. But it's starting to look like MCAS probably is underpinning substantial portions of the populations bearing a humongous range of chronic inflammatory disorders and allergic disorders and dystrophic uh, disorders. And so now, all of a sudden, doctors really need to know about this, uh, but it's extraordinarily complex. I mean, more than a thousand mediators, each mediator has a huge range of direct and indirect, local and remote, acute and delayed and chronic effects. I mean, you do the, the permutational, the combinatorial math on how many different ways that inappropriate mast cell activation might be able to clinically present and you come up with a number so big, you, you, you can't even imagine it. And that's a huge part of the problem too, because not only do doctors not have any prior awareness of this disease, because they've not been taught this, because we haven't even known about the existence of this until recently, even though in truth, it's been smack dab in front of every doctor's face all day long, every day, their whole careers. I was about 70 patients in to accruing my own personal series of patients who I came to recognize had MCAS at the root of their troubles. I was about 70, uh, seven zero, 70 patients in before I found the first one who I thought bore some reasonable degree of similarity to any of the others. That's a degree of heterogeneity and variability that no doctor is trained to, to deal with, to, to recognize what's really going on. I mean, you spoke about the heterogeneity of how MCAS presents. Now, for people, when we're talking about long COVID and the kind of symptoms that present as a result of long COVID, this all sounds extremely familiar. Um, I was wondering if I could just ask you what your experience has been in terms of the patients you've seen who've had um, chronic symptoms after a COVID infection and how that might potentially be related to MCAS. You know, I, I've seen enough and you see these themes of chronic multi-system inflammation, the, the, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory tract, the GI tract, the genitourinary tract, the muscles, the bones, the, the other soft tissues, ligaments, ten, tendons, the, the, both the central and the peripheral uh, nervous system. And you can imagine that the central nervous system problems lead to not only what are classified as neurologic problems, but also as psychiatric uh, problems. So patients often are reluctant to admit they have a psychiatric problem, but they'll say, you know, gosh, I've been having so much, uh, so many uh, mood problems. Um, and, uh, and the cognitive, uh, the executive functioning issues, the cognitive function, uh, dysfunction is just legion uh, in these uh, patients. And it's just another manifestation of the inflammation. When you get patients, I, mean, I don't know if you've seen patients with, uh, who've had COVID months and months ago and are still suffering symptoms. Oh, yeah. So how do you, what have you found to be the most effective treatments for them? And, and what have they responded well to? Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're asking me about the long COVID population or any other segment of the MCAS population. Everybody wants to know what's the magic answer, what's going to fix it. And I don't doubt that in time enough research will be done to be able to distinguish at a biological and molecular level the different variants of MCAS, but at present, the state of the science in this area is so immature, we don't have any ability to do that. And so there's no shortcut 
to both the patient and the treating clinician, both of them practicing an enormous amount of patience and persistence and a very methodical approach in stepping through the trials of these many different treatments. I mean, we tend to start with antihistamines simply because the fact is most mast cell patients actually are significantly benefited by some combination of H1 and H2 blocking and they're cheap drugs and they're long-term safe drugs. So since you got to start the trials of these many different drugs somewhere, kind of makes all the sense in the world to start with the antihistamines. And actually I've got no end of emails from um, actually from health professionals who were struck by COVID and long COVID and were languishing for month after month after month. And then they saw my article um, and a light bulb turned on and they started taking, uh, for some of them, they didn't even have to bother with an H2 blocker. Some of them, they just started up with an H1 blocker and within hours to days, they said, oh my God, I can't believe how much better I'm feeling. And yeah, they still really ought to undergo the diagnostic workup to be sure it's really a mast cell disorder we're dealing with. But when you have that dramatic a response to an antihistamine, it's a pretty strong suggestion that what you're probably dealing with is a mast cell disorder. What does it take to do that workup? To actually get that sort of diagnosis, what do you need to do? Yeah. You have no idea how badly I wish it were simpler. The only problems left to be solved are the complicated ones, and you cannot get more complicated than MCAS. I've learned that quite well in my third of a century in, in medicine. I hope that within the next 10 to 20 years, the testing will become much simpler, much easier, much cheaper by switching to a genetically focused line of investigation, one blood sample, one tissue sample, certain special genetic testing, and we will have nailed not only that it is a mast cell activation uh, disorder, but much more, uh, but, but even more importantly, which particular variant it is. Until then, uh, I mean, that, that is testing that can be done in a very few research laboratories around the world at present, but we are years away from that testing migrating from the research labs to the clinical labs. So until then, we are stuck with having to, for, for the most part, uh, measure levels in the blood and the urine of various mediators that are relatively specific to the mast cell. I mean, the mast cell does put out more than a thousand mediators, but first of all, it's not terribly practical to measure a thousand things. And the fact is that actually the majority of the mast cells mediators, we can't even presently test for them in any clinical laboratories. We can test for them in the research laboratories. That's how we know they exist but we can't yet test for them in the clinical laboratory. And of the minority that we can test for in the clinical laboratory, the great majority of those are not particularly specific to the mast cell. So in the end, out of more than a thousand mediators at present, we are stuck with about 10 that are measurable in a clinical laboratory and are relatively specific to the mast cell. So you might think, okay, well, that's not too bad. It's just 10. Most of the mast cell mediators actually have very short lifespans in the body, a half-life, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, heparin, for example, has a half-life of um, eh, about 30 to 60 seconds. So good luck finding it. And, 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 th and that is at room temperature or anything higher like body temperature. Prostaglandin D2 has a half-life that's been estimated somewhere between one minute and 30 minutes. 
in different studies. And based on what I've been observing, I think it's a whole lot closer to one minute than it is to 30 minutes. These tests, by and large, are not done at the local laboratory. They have to be done at very distantly located reference, you know, specialty laboratories. And these mediators disappear so quickly. So you got to keep the samples continuously chilled from the moment they come out of the patient's body and continue to keep them chilled every step in handling. So if only one person in this entire long, complex chain of specimen handling if only one person does their job wrong and just leaves the specimen unchilled for just a few minutes. Forget it, we've lost, we, we, we've lost what we're looking for. What advice um, do you give your patients in terms of how they manage the condition beyond taking H1, H2 blockers? The patients have got, who are suffering with long COVID, with fatigue, with headaches, with breathlessness, with tachycardia, what, <laughs> what advice do you give them? What, what I've what learned is, yeah, the, the, the general approach to managing MCAS, and but at least in the long COVID patients I see and, and many of the long COVID patients I read about, it sure looks like MCAS is a very large part of what's going on in them. The general approach to managing MCAS, step one, Identify your triggers as precisely as you can, and then do your best to avoid them for the simple reason that it's actually kind of hard for any drug to gain good, sustained control over dysfunctional mast cells when the patient is simultaneously, persistently ingesting or otherwise exposing herself or himself to a trigger. And, and, and listen, I'm well aware of how difficult it usually is to pin down exactly what a person's, uh, what a mast cell patient's triggers are. But nevertheless, if you don't even try, then the outcome is going to be a foregone conclusion. You will continue exposing yourself to your triggers and it will remain difficult to control the disease. So step one, identify your triggers as precisely as you can. Do your best to uh, avoid them. Step two, identify your optimal antihistamine regimen. And again, we, we, you know, you've heard my reasons for why we start the pharmacologic management of this disease with the antihistamines. I ask my patients to step through systematic trials, not much time, just a couple of weeks each with each of the different H1 blockers to figure out which one will serve them better than the others. And then they switch to the best one, start using it regularly. And then, uh, and, and generally, uh, and there are always exceptions, but generally it's twice a day dosing with the H1 blockers. Uh, and we focus on the non-sedating H1 blockers because MCAS in almost everybody is a chronically fatiguing disease. So why on earth would a chronically fatigued person want to be taking, uh, regularly taking a sedating drug? So for most of these patients, they really can identify one particular one that clearly serves them better than the others. And if they're going to be on antihistamines for a long time to come, they might as well be on the best one. And then they pile on top of that similar rotating trials of the H2 blockers to find which of those serves them best. And it is a different combination in different patients. I don't doubt that in time, the research will help us understand why it's a different combination in different patients, but we are a long way away from having that science and being able to reliably predict which H1 and which H2 will best serve the individual patient. So it's trial and error for right now. And then after you've completed step two of identifying your optimal antihistamine regimen, then steps three through N or to try, 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 and then try some more. The many, 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 many other drugs which have been found helpful in various mast cell patients. And let me tell you something, it is far more, at this point anyway, far more clinical art and clinical experience than it is any established published clinical science 
as to the particular sequence of trying these various drugs that appears to be best in the individual patient. Can I name you a drug or two which is going to reliably be helpful in the majority of long COVID patients? Hell no, because the particular profile of symptoms is going to be quite different from one COVID patient to the next, which means the nature the at the molecular level, the nature of the mast cell dysfunction in each of those patients is different and they're going to need different drugs. I promise the patients and their treating doctors that when the two of them, uh, the patient and the doc stumble across the particular drug, uh, particular drugs, uh, that is the particular molecules that happen to be the right molecular keys for fitting into the particular molecular lock that is that particular patient's individual variant of the disease they've come to acquire. They'll come back in just a month. The doc will walk into the exam room and his head will spin 360. It'll be so obvious how much better the patient is. I mean, that, that's what I'm hearing when, for example, these long COVID uh, patients, these doctors, I've had some medical students uh, and some nurses write me that, you know, within hours to days of starting uh, antihistamines, oh my God, they can't believe how much better uh, they feel. Does it get them 100% better? No, uh, but it gets them significantly better. Uh, not, not all of them, but, but many of them. And then they set about exploring other treatments uh, to see how much more better they can get. Obviously, drugs are, you know, try this, try that. But, and it's different for everybody, as you described. What about triggers? Are there, let's say, the three most common triggers that you frequently see? I mean, yes, of course, there can be thousands, but... <laughs> I've not found them. Yeah. It's... It's, you're looking for simplicity. It's not there. Or if it is there, I'm not smart enough to have been able to see it yet. You know, sometimes the simplest things are right before our eyes and for various legitimate reasons, we can't see them. Not until somebody makes some critical breakthrough. And at that point, everybody says, oh, of course, that was obvious. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't so obvious or it would have been figured out a long time ago. Each patient needs to be evaluated individually. So everybody wants one simple pat answer that applies to the whole population. And I'm sorry, but the nature of the disease, as best we presently understand it, just doesn't allow for simple answers like that. Come back in, I don't know, 50 or 100 years, maybe we'll have simple answers, but it's probably gonna take that long. Um, one of the other uh, parts of this puzzle, obviously MCAS does seem to be a, a large part of this uh, puzzle for long COVID, but one of the other sort of really interesting uh, hypotheses is around the NAD plus uh, deficiency theory. The sirtuins, activation of the sirtuins by the virus, um, change the way that your the, the pathways work. You end up stealing tryptophan rather than uh, the rest of it, and that creates basically a cascade of other stuff. Um, There's no question. There are lots of cascades, lots of complex intertwining networks. I don't want to give anybody the the impression that in an MCAS patient, whether long COVID or, or any other MCAS patient, that it's just the mast cells that are misbehaving. I mean, the domino chain consequences of this, uh, you, you, you could spend the rest of your life trying to uh, trace down all the consequences uh, of this. So there's no way I'm going to say in something, in a situation, a clinical situation as complex as either acute or long COVID, that it's just a mast cell disorder. So could there be other factors um, either in all patients or maybe in select patients? like the, the, the deficiency, uh, like NAD plus deficiency? Yeah, there could be. And then the question gets raised, well, how is that interacting with any 
particular type of mast cell misbehavior. Um, I, I mean, you just wind up with a headache uh, every day. <laughs> that is true. To think of all the permutations uh, of what can be going on uh, in this disease. Um, and again, with enough research, enough time, enough resources, I don't doubt we'll figure it out. Uh, but it, it's it's hard research. Indeed, it really is, and it's going to take a serious amount of time before the medical establishment comes up with concrete answers about the precise pathology of conditions like long COVID. Like me, you probably left this interview with as many new questions as answers. Well, fear not. I'm going to put up another film tomorrow explaining how it's going to work, but on Thursday at 7pm GMT, I'm going to be having a live interactive podcast on the Stereo app with Dr Tina Pears, who, if you're new to the channel, is herself an MCAST specialist in the UK. So if you've got any questions you'd like to ask her, then you'll be able to speak to us then, and hopefully we can address some of them in a productive way. Till next time.